Hello, and thank you for choosing this Analyst Insight podcast from the Information Security Forum. Hello to all those who are tuning in every couple of weeks to listen. Keep coming back as we've got lots of very different subjects to explore over the next few months. Lots of surprises. Uh, If this is your first time listening, glad to have you. Welcome. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for the continued support. Uh, Tell your friends, tell your colleagues, uh, turn on, tune in, listen up. Do people tune in anymore? Anyway. Uh, We want these podcasts to handle lots of issues, so if there is something you think we should pursue, something bothering you, then by all means let us know. Um, We're starting to get emails, so thank you for those, but keep them coming. Um, Contact details are on the Audio Boom page where every episode is available. But this episode is going to explore a topic that comes up every time anyone in InfoSec meets anyone else from InfoSec. How did you get here? Uh, Not just the transport, but just your... Well, what made you choose this as a career and then sort of also questions about why they switched to it uh my name is mark ward i'm a senior research analyst at the isf and my route into infosec um built on i suppose a teenage interest in computer security fueled by reading lots of cyberpunk stories about hard-eyed hackers cracking ice and pounding away on decks that kind of thing and uh movies like war games which absolutely helped as well um, but here to, to share her story about getting into information security is Jamina Laka Kalari, who is currently working as a cyber engagement specialist at Finnish steelmaker Autokumpu. Hello, Jamina. Hello. Glad to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Um, you've got a background in studying history. So is there a, a period of history you like the most or when you would have liked to have been allies? <laughs> Well, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I've always fancied a lot uh, medieval times, but I do have to admit that I don't think that I would have liked to live (laughs) during that time period. Yeah, a time to see but not live through. Yeah, yes, quite challenging from a medical point of view, I think. Yes, yes. Definitely. Um, Also here is regular Paul Watts, uh, one of the ISF's distinguished analysts who's a former CISO. Uh, How about you, Paul? Has history taught you anything? Uh... And, but to be honest with you, mate, in the moment, I've just got that song from Freak Power going around in my head, Turn On, Tune In, Cop Out. It's like something you triggered <laughs> very early on in the recording. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy being a, being a child of the 70s. And, uh, you, you know, uh, would I, I, I certainly don't think I want to go back to the whole medieval time. Although, I mean, nothing wrong with a good hot roast, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love a good joust as well? Indeed. Um, but, uh, Jimena, just to... Um, Explore your background a bit because uh, you work for um, that's steelmaker out of Cumbria. You st- spent quite a long time studying history, so yeah, just I'm curious about why why the switch or yeah, just w- are the two related? And any you know, what you do now is that related to what you did before? I suspect not. <laughs> no, and I, ha- I have to admit that my you know coming into the field of cybersecurity is very different. I would say from the kind of the regular path. So in high school, if someone had told me that I would be working in the field of cybersecurity, I would have laughed. <laughs> no way, that's that's definitely not going to be where I'm going to be working at. And actually, when I got off from high school, I was supposed to, or I studied uh, to become a nurse and a midwife wow. uh, for a year, then what? learned that that's definitely not something that I want to do either. All right. <laughs> Good to find and, out earlier. I suppose. Yes, yes, definitely. And um, how I got into the field of history was actually very um, strange or peculiar in the sense that my best friend was going for the entrance exam and she wanted someone to come with her. And I was like, okay, I can come with you. <laughs> and, right. and then to a bit of a surprise, I got in to study history. So it was it was not on my road map either to b- become a historian uh, in a sense either. But then I studied history and I graduated or did my master's in there as well, went into mm-hmm. working life and was like, well, this is interesting, but not something that I want to do for the rest of my life. All right. And then uh, I think it was around when GDPR came, so 2018, I was working in an office job where we had to do this GDPR training. And the mindset was that kind of do the training as quick as possible so that you can go on to do the rest of your working or the real job tasks. 
And oh. that's how I got interested in that. How do we actually make trainings that are effective and engaging? Because then, of course, the training's <laughs> purpose is to, you know, change behavior or the, that the adults or the trainees are actually learning something. Yeah. And that's when I got very interested on the topic of cybersecurity, but especially how we can teach adults about cybersecurity in an efficient right. and ineffective way. And then I applied to a university. Uh, my city uh, teaches or the university teaches cybersecurity on master's level. And luckily they have noted that uh, you don't have to be an IT specialist uh, to no. have a master's in cybersecurity. So you could apply for that master's <laughs> studies e even without the IT background. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for the university uh, uh, or the school and then I got in and then mm -hmm. I did my studies. And, and the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> to continue that theme. Yeah. Paul, I don't know. Is, is that a... Because it just, I wonder if everybody in every career, when they meet someone else who works in that career, says, how do you get here? And it's always an accident. But it doesn't seem the case, because I think there are a lot of very direct paths that people take to particular jobs. But InfoSec does seem to be a bit of a, an accident for a lot of people. I don't know if you find that. Well, the thing is, it's it, it's still quite new. So, I suppose, you know, yeah. I remember when I, I you know, maybe back in the 80s, I watched a, watched a film called War Games, which I've, yeah. I've talked about numerous times on the podcast. But that was my inspiration to get in. Um, to technology, but security wasn't wasn't really a thing. I mean, that piqued my interest, but there wasn't really any root in it. I I didn't wake up and decide I would, you know, like someone wanted to be a doctor, someone would be a fireman, I wanted to be a CISO. I mean, that that bit kind of <laughs> happened by by accident. What a strange I, dream that was. You <laughs> literally slept walked in, you know, in, into that into that situation, um, yeah. and that's kind of creates a bit of a problem in 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 the. Uh, I mean, it's great. To, to, to hear Jemina say that there are universities out there that say you don't need technology to get a career in cyber. Hallelujah. Because yes. they don't all say that. Yeah. Um, but if you if you cut across the sort of the the the, 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 the fifty year olds look at look at security, most of them came from a technical background because that's how it evolved. And what we're now what we're now spotting is because the technology's caught up with the consumer, you know, any any anybody with a credit card and a web browser can hire a data center in the sky even my mum could do it oh my god that's not bear thinking about but <laughs> well, the, the reality is is that we now need to think it's mainstream you know, technology is the business so you know you have to think about it's how true. security technology and business kind of work in confluence with each other in mm -hmm. order to do that you need a different and diverse set of skills so the industry desperately needs people uh, like Jamina to come in and bring back uh, to to the the kind of faculty of security, so it's so refreshing to hear that. Also refreshing to hear somebody kind of their their journey started with GDPR. So GDPR actually did something useful. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so wow. yeah, it brought something Ooh. good for. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I yeah, long may it continue. Um, but uh, yeah, I was a more I took a traditional route in, but I didn't I didn't mean to be a C. So that kind of. Yeah, but I, I suppose, that, I guess you're right that it's unfamiliar because it is relatively new. And that, yeah, I certainly don't want to reveal my age, but when, yeah, the word computer science 25. class, <laughs> a very old looking 25. Yeah, the word computer science class is when I was uh, at school. And it was and it was only via that sort of movies and books that I could actually, you know, explore some of that because the computers were clearly a thing and I'm not that old. But, you know, it was a case of, yeah, but I guess, but do you mean, I, I mean, I don't want to ask your age, obviously, but I, I guess it was just, but to Paul's 18. point about <laughs> every, everybody being familiar with technology now, because um, we were talking to someone a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, that will appear next week, I believe, um, uh, Patricia Rodriguez, who, you know, said technology is her life. But uh, but equally, I think that doesn't, people feel familiar with it, so I don't know whether that means that they feel like they don't need to do it for a career. I don't know. It's it's a curious, curious place to be. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to say that even when I was in high school a few years back, <laughs> yeah. you know, IT was still, I would say that uh, even though we were used to IT, but it was still thought of that it's only for the men or that, you know, guys uh, right. are interested hey. on IT. And it was, it was not very much pushed forward that, you know, girls could also study IT or, you know, take a career out of IT and... Yeah. So it, it is interesting. But I have to say that when I started my studies in cybersecurity, 
I would say that half of the class were women. So it was a bit bit okay. of a surprise Why not? as well, because I had thought of that I will be the only woman and I'll be the only person out of the IT scope studying cybersecurity. And when I got into the school, mm. it was actually the opposite. I would say that one third was uh, people with background on IT. Then we were the one third uh-huh. that had totally, you know, opposite. And then we had mm-hmm. one third who had background in army or in military. So we were yeah. a very good mix of people. <laughs> yeah, quite a curious mix. Yeah. I mean, is that is it common, Paul? Do you sort of that, that kind of, you mean you said a lot of people have te- technical backgrounds, but do you see a lot of people from the army as well, from military I was, sources? I was, I, I, I come to that. I was just reminiscing um, when I did computing um, at Loughborough uh, back in the, back in the nineties. And um, there were, there were, there were two women on my course. I think there was 50, 60 of us. Um, if we then mixed with a, a new course, it just started as I went in as a fresher, which was computing and business. Uh, yeah. I think there were four women on that on that one. So, you know, and, and that, that that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. that, that that seed into, you know, computing being blended with a non-technical, um, non-technical uh, subject, yeah. uh, there were more, more women. The more technical role, less women and um, and it's it was i mean things had balanced out i i, I was um i went back to i was i loved that every minute of this by the way when i went back and did a guest lecture at loughborough earlier in this year and it was uh down the middle boys girls brilliant well, fantastic so things yeah. are starting to change for the uh for, for, for the better there yeah. um in answer to your other question um i've seen a lot of people coming out of the forces and coming into security uh when i worked in the public sector uh they were very hot on it as well um, if you got cut across security leadership, there are lots of people who are ex ex military, and so that's that's definitely a, a transitional route in uh, mm. to to the industry. But that and that's not really to the detriment of trying to broaden those skills either. Yeah. You, you know, they're bringing something very very different to the uh, to to the party. So that that's definitely a, a barrier to entry. And mm. we should also because um, we I, I got told off about this um when I, I spoke at Inversec a couple of weeks ago and I didn't didn't mean to do this but let's be very very clear uh, university is not the only route into our industry by any stretch of the imagination you, there are you can go direct entry there are apprenticeships there are vocational beds scholarships loads of different ways in you don't need the degree to work in cyber no I think that's true yeah because we, we certainly explored that on a few of the podcasts there's one quite um a series we're doing on sort of pathways into infosec and a lot of the people there some of them come very strange well not strange but you'd say uh, circuitous routes uh, as one guy we were talking to last week used to be a um, session musician um and uh, saw an advert and do you want to work at infosec <laughs> and re- <laughs> responded to it and uh, yeah a few years later a couple of certifications under his belt and, and there he is um and, but he's uh, i mean again a podcast coming up in a couple of weeks but yeah it's an interesting way to go topic you studied i think for your masters was in history was about uh, divorce in ireland yeah and how that changed so i just wonder is that was i don't know if that was a particular interest of yours or there were lessons there in terms of because i think it was the two referendums 86 and 95 and 86 uh, yes the, 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 it didn't pass and then 95 it did free so it, was it that social change you were interested in sort of what brought that about yes yeah uh, so i've always been very interested on well, of course, equality, but then also these big societal changes. And when I decided what I want to do for my master's thesis, the only kind of uh, limitation was that uh, the the material has to be in English. So that's why I oh, <laughs> became <right>. Ireland. <laughs> so that was I an see. easy choice. And they had a lot of a lot of different material for that uh, for that or during that period. <laughs> But I have to say that it was, I first I thought that it's not going to be that interesting subject because divorce, well, you know, what's there to debate about? But then actually <laughs> what I learned uh, with the master's uh, studies or with the study was that uh, the words that we use are actually <laughs> very revealing in a sense that, uh, for example, the word divorce for the Irish case, there were two sides how the uh, word was used. So the one side was that divorce is this thing that, you know, uh, frees women out of poor marriages and they are able to go and, you know, work and be free. 
but then others use the word divorce as this uh, way that it's actually, you know, worsening women's position that now well, the husbands are able to leave the poor women <laughs> I see. when wow. they get older and get a new wife so that women are left <sighs> without a husband to take care of them or, uh, you know, that the society now th then has to take care of these poor women. And I think that was very interesting because I never thought yeah. that, you know, words can actually have different meanings, the one yeah. word, but then actually, yeah. you know, it is, it is something. And the words that we use, they tell a lot about how we perceive the world. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to bring into the cyber world as well, because yeah. have we ever asked for, for example, the CEO or the C-suite that what do they actually do? think when we say the word cybersecurity, most mm. probably not. And that would reveal actually a lot about what their mindset is regarding the subject. Yeah. Yeah. Cause your, I think your job title is cyber engagement specialist, which I, I thought was an interesting choice because it's not information security yes. engagement specialist. It's so, I mean, yeah, there's a lot, mm. I think in fact, it's yeah, fascinating that, that those meanings do swirl around those those words and did generally i guess you had that problem of all just people think of different things when you say cyber or, in, or infosec to them oh yeah 100 percent. and I was, I, was, I was just reflecting on what jamina was saying i always remember uh lead singer of coldplay chris martin and gwyneth paltrow when they decided to divorce <laughs> um when they talked about that publicly they used the phrase conscious was uncoupling that was which it, was a, a softer <laughs> way to say you know, we 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 were going our separate ways. Yeah. Um. And you know, using the right words in the right context at the right time is absolutely critical. Yeah. Um. I remember um in one of my roles, uh, <laughs> the chief executive introduced me to some of our investors as the uh, uh the the uh, the the fishing guy. You know, and you you, you then realise that you're Cheers. you know the, the 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 sentiment and and what you mean to those organisations can can be driven by the way that we perform, the way that we portray ourselves, the language that we use, um, and it's why I recently released a paper uh, and ISF members I've encouraged you to download it and, and read it about the fact that actually change is a two way street, and and you know to Jamin's absolutely valid point, you know it it has to be you know both parties have to be on a level. I talk about unlocking the value of security. It's not just about ticking a box. It's not just about complying with regulations. It's not just about what you should not do. It's about being able to do things in a conscious, safe and balanced way, ultimately to drive value for the organization in which you serve. Now, you start using that sort of language in a boardroom, you're going to get a conversation. If you go in there and say, uh, you're 23 controls down from your compliance score of 100%. You need an EDR, an ABC, and an SOC, and an XDM. Um, they're already back face face down yeah. in their iPads thinking about their their uh, their lunch. Um, yeah. I think it's a real it's a point very very well made. Yeah. So uh, is that what what you're doing? Doing just trying to understand how your organisation thinks about cybersecurity and just get people to appreciate what exactly it means. Yeah. So. Uh... I have the responsibility regarding all the communications and then the trainings re uh, regarding or related to cybersecurity. And of course, that uh, one task is that uh, I try to understand how the company perceives cybersecurity so that I can also help my team members then mm -hmm. so that they can deliver uh, or they can uh, help out with their stakeholders regarding cyber okay. security. Yeah. So is it is cyber security quite a big function at, at Google? No, we are actually a yeah. very small team. Uh, we grew a lot during this year. So last yeah. year, around this time, there was only three people, I think, in the cybersecurity wow. team. Now so, we are a team of nine, if I remember. Wow. So we've grown a lot during this yeah. year, but I think it's a very very interesting and very nice thing that there's a lot of new team members uh, in our team because we are all very excited. <laughs> of course, we are very enthusiastic. To, you know, to, <laughs> we don't have that backlog or the legacy, legacy stuff no, you know, binding true. us. <laughs> so we are Probably all on the it. same page with yeah. the freshness and the newestness. So we are driving each other forward. So, so. Right. And, it, and is that new emphasis on security because 
there's a new CISO or something like that, or the company just, or you've got some high level I, support? I think both. I think both. So we got a new CISO last, uh, last autumn, uh, Petri okay. Koivisto started. And I think he made a very good point or a very good impression uh, for the management team to understand that we actually, or Otokumpu does need a good cybersecurity team in order to mm -hmm. keep the company secure. So I think he did a very good job on that. And then he got to recruit us. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. Because I think recruitment is tough at the moment because there's a lot of places out there and there's a lot of uh, very lucrative roles that people can slide into. So yeah, interesting. that. And presumably, even though there's just nine of you, I guess you're trying to get allies and friends and you know there's champions elsewhere as well I'll get that part of the role too yes yes definitely so we are in uh, in a position right now that uh, we are you know of course looking at the counterparts uh, trying to find the key people in different locations or sites and different mm. uh in different countries and in different businesses okay. uh we are a global company which of course mm. brings its own interest and perks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. into finding and finding the key <laughs> yeah. yes finding the key key roles in it and uh but i have to say that because the company has a very strong culture on this regular safety and security i think mm -hmm. it's very easy to build good cyber security culture on top of that because there is the okay. mindset already regarding security mm -hmm. so so, so, so just adding the cybersecurity aspect into that. So we don't want to push anything or we don't want to, uh, of course, human safety always comes first. That's <laughs> of course, no, no brainer, but yep. we don't want to, you know, say that cybersecurity is any more, uh, important than any other type. So we are there on the same page, uh, with safety and security. So we want to work with them together and be their, you know, their counter. That's a really, really interesting point. And it's a mistake that a lot of organizations make when they're trying to do cybersecurity awareness is the importance of understanding the cultural organizational context. So if you are a safety critical organization, you know, that that is an in, that is a, a, a you know, an angle in which to present how security can, can help, in, you know, strengthen the, 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 you know, the importance of safety in an organization. So that there's, there's an angle there. Equally, if you're a multinational, whilst you might agree what your core cyber security messages are, they have to translate to multiple markets and multiple specialisms. So the yeah. way that you the way that you engage with an audience in Asia Pack might be slightly different from the way you engage with an audience in Slovenia or Germany or Ontario, Canada or something like that. So you, you have to remember, you have to take the time to know your audience because you can't, yeah, you, you can't use the same tool to engage with all of those audiences and get the same value return. If you want them to be part of your cyber workforce, no, that's a bit of a cliche. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to resonate with them. So I think yeah. that's that's a really really valuable piece of insight there. It's it's, it's great to hear that you that you you've jumped on that and you know Petri and the team uh, are going from strength to strength because it's relatable, right? It yeah. relates to the business. Yes, definitely. And I have to highlight that. Of course, we have to understand that kind of the basic knowledge on cybersecurity differs so much based on where you are located. So we cannot mm -hmm. expect that everyone has the basic knowledge on cybersecurity what we for example have in finland which i think is very high but then we have to understand that not not all the countries that we are located in the society is bringing cyber awareness so much into the public discourse that we have to be mindful of that and then maybe have something extra measures for those places yeah i think yeah. as well there's, there's this kind of i mean it's good that there is a culture of understanding safety and security in Outcompu, but I think in a lot of organizations, that's not the case and people do their job and then Infosec on those responsibilities for you know, handling risks, just uh, it's something else they have to do and they don't want to do it. Why would I want to do that? Because I just want to get on with my job. And I think that, and that's, and I think that embedded culture can be really difficult to shift because they just, you know, they, they feel like it's not their job, not part of their job because they've been doing their job for a long time and that hasn't featured. I know you've talked in the past, Paul, about culture and that, but it does seem like it's a hard thing to shift once it gets embedded. Well, I mean, you, you, you kind of, you go back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, if, if, if an employee thinks that that imposition of cybersecurity training, um, is adding friction to their day job, then it's, you're not, 
oh well either it's not really been been sold to them particularly well or they can't see the value to them on a personal level you know one of the greatest tips i can share with anybody um when you're really really struggling to kind of penetrate the market and get the messaging across is to make it relatable not only to the business but also relatable to the employee so for example rather than going in bulldozing the uh, the corporate agenda about cybersecurity and how it's important whilst that obviously is is the uh, is the ultimate ambition start to talk to employees about how you keep them safe how they protect their children on mm. social media applications you know how to uh, how to spot when an email is is fraudulent how to not have your social media account taken over now immediately you're giving them you're imparting conventional wisdom advice and guidance that affects them at a very very personal level and suddenly they're going jamina is somebody who's relevant because she helps me as an individual and now i'm starting to think differently about the way i work i bring those different behaviors to the office i'm now contributing to a safety and security culture which jamina can then solidify by starting to talk about the message in the context of the organization and that's the pathway that you follow so that that pulse check to make sure that the employees are getting it and they're not resentful of what you're trying to say to them. You need to be doing that reasonably early on in your in your in your culture transformation program, if I can call it that. Because if they if they're telling you they don't get it, then it's incumbent on you to, you know, go again, take a slightly different pitch, listen and reciprocate. People like to know they're being listened to. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but some really useful advice, I think, for those trying to get into it and struggling. Don't just do it to tick a box. Anybody out there is doing a death by PowerPoint, cybersecurity training, tick a box to get a certification, <laughs> you're going to fail. Sorry. Yeah. That, yeah. That, I that think, cold hard fact. I think the listening part is to, it can be a bit difficult because I think there's there's a bit of a, I think with Insect, there's a bit of a conscience element to it. People feel like they're the, 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 the good side, they, they work for the good side. So they, you know, there's a light to carry and then they have to warn people about the bad behaviors. But I think that, can come across just in the wrong way sometimes. I don't know if you find that, Jamina, just the, the the way you go to approach people has a, an impact on how, how they receive your message. Yeah, definitely. And I would like to come back to that, that what words they are actually using. This, again, reveals a lot. So when you are listening, you know, actually do active listening. <laughs> what do they actually mean with the words? And what 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 meanings do they, uh, do they give to their words? So... That is, I would say, the key to understanding how you can actually then change their mm. behavior, because then you understand what, if you say a threat, what what does that mean to them? So if you want to tackle the threat, then you have to understand what the threat means to them, uh, per se. Yeah, yeah, within their context. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Um just want to say thank you for Joina for your time today, and thank you, Paul, as well. I say just to round off, is there a thinking of those words, is there a word that you can use to summarize uh, InfoSec, Paul? As sort of working in InfoSec, what is it? If there's a, I, Jamina as well, if there's a, a word, I guess my word, word of choice would be challenging. But if, uh, Paul, I don't know if you've got a, a word or a phrase that you think. A word to describe cybersecurity, what, as a profession, as a yeah, thing? Yeah, and what's it like to work in information security in a word? Roller coaster. Jamina? My word would be interesting. Interesting. <laughs> In all that it means. An interesting <laughs> roller coaster. Yes. yes. A challenging and interesting roller coaster. Yes. There you go. There's a definition of every new <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, to, thank you both, and thanks for listening. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues. Uh, you can now find ISF Podcasts on all major podcast platforms. Look at the show notes for our page on Audio Room, where you can subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode. Uh, the podcasts are also available at securityforum.org, where you can also learn much more about ISF research tools and guidance.